Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots Monday morning. Uh, I'm uh, one of your hosts. I'm Katie Halper, and uh, this is, of course, where we react to the Sunday morning news shows that we watch so that you don't have to. I'm the second host, Aaron Maté, and yes, uh, good Monday morning, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. It's great to see everybody, especially those who are watching with us live. Thanks oh, yeah. for being here. If you're doing so, please like the stream so that Katie doesn't yell at you shortly exactly. for not liking it in sufficient numbers. And also remember, if you want to support the show, go to usefulidiotspodcast.com. Support the show, keep it going, and get bonus content. Yeah, and I'm wearing these uh, Palestine earrings, uh, little uh, watermelon earrings. And shout out to Jen Perelman, who's running it against... Um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida, because that's the person who uh, wore them on my show. And I asked her where she got them. And one thing led to another, and now I have these great earrings. Well, that's great. And we're going to talk a lot about Gaza today because, um, well, there's a lot to cover, including, and let's just acknowledge it. Uh, it has happened, this sort of emerged in more detail after the Sunday morning show. So it's not really covered there, but of course, even if it had come out before, right, they wouldn't have anyway. The cover, but basically, Israel just committed one of its worst atrocities so so far. I mean, it's it's hard to categorize them, quantify them, but it, this is just beyond words. They've withdrawn from Al Shifa Hospital, which is the largest medical complex in Gaza, and left it in ruins. They've destroyed much of it, including its its specialized surgery wing, and they've left hundreds of corpses behind in the most gruesome fashion and we have to just acknowledge that because it's happening as you know before our eyes with our support our government's funding it providing the cover for it and as we can see from our sunday morning news shows our our cable news media continues to provide the political cover uh for it including the uh atrocity at al-shifa because if you remember when israel first attacked al-shifa back in november all the major u.s media outlets came out and pretty much in lockstep repeated the U.S. government's lie, along with the Israeli government's lie, that under al-Shifa was this uh, Hamas command and control no node. That was the term used by John Kirby of the White House. And everybody in the U.S. media laundered it. U.S. intelligence officials told them that they had intelligence backing this up, and everybody repeated it. It was a complete lie. But right. it was used to manufacture support for doing the unthinkable, which is destroying uh, not only Gaza's largest hospital, but pretty much all the hospitals in Gaza, because very few of them now are still operable. So that's what's happening. And remember the first time, uh, the first round of attacking a hospital from this uh, onslaught against Gaza, and the refrain was Israel would never attack a hospital? Right. When um, the there was that missile fired at a hospital that I believe was the Al Adi hospital. Yeah, um, I believe it. Was. And uh, and it was unclear immediately who did it. And yes, exactly. Ever, ever, you know, the refrain was Israel would never do that. Well, exactly. In the period since, Israel proceeded to, to methodically attack Gaza's hospital, including its largest one, uh, Al Shifa. Yeah, and. Uh... Yeah, there. I mean, there have been photos uh, and videos of just the bodies left behind. Um, absolutely gruesome photos. And this is who Israel is. And it's not just the Israeli government. This is who Israel is. And this is what Israelis support, by and large. Well, uh, let's check in with um, our, our corporate media. Uh, and, you know, I guess we can start actually, though, rather than go to meet the press as we, as we, as we normally do. Let's just get a quick, a quick dispatch of what the scene is like from Al Jazeera. Something that you probably wouldn't see. Yeah, right. This is this media. is like right. This is the it's, this is the the time where we have to show you something that is not on the Sunday morning news shows, and that could be and should be on the Sunday morning news shows. Al Shifa Hospital, following. We are now inside Al Shifa Hospital following the withdrawal of Israeli forces after a two week military operation. 
there is total destruction. Buildings in all departments have been burned, and the structure of the complex has been damaged from the inside. Stairs, doors, and even the walls are completely destroyed. From what we can see, it appears the occupation forces deliberately targeted the health sector and destroyed the largest medical complex in Gaza City, in fact, in the whole strip. This complex used to provide care to about 2 million 300,000 people in all specializations. Now it's demolished and out of service, and no one can repair what is left. People are trying to salvage what they can from the ruins. The hospital was also serving as a shelter for displaced people, but now it's destroyed. There is no life here. The complex is in ruins and cannot be revived. All right. Well, uh, and those scenes are just starting to come out from Al-Shifa. Um, we don't even know the full extent of the atrocities uh, there yet, including all the people who have been massacred in, in recent weeks. Uh, but there's footage of disfigured, charred bodies. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, and, and this show is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be funny, but we also have to acknowledge what's unfolding in front of us and uh that's what it is yeah. it's just the reality okay let's turn let's turn to meet the press good sunday morning and happy easter the 2024 campaign is intensifying with that historic show of force for president biden from his democratic predecessors barack obama and bill clinton at radio city music hall the Biden campaign also announcing a new effort to reach out to Nikki Haley voters using Donald Trump's own words against him. She is, she's gone haywire. There aren't that many never Trumpers anymore. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters back into the town? I'm not sure we need too many. Meanwhile, this week, the former president stepped up his attacks on the judge and his family in the New York hush money case. After that, judge imposed a partial gag order on Mr. Trump less than three weeks from the April 15th start date in that trial. And now Trump is asserting that none of the trials should, quote, take place during my campaign, falsely calling the criminal proceedings election interference. It is yet another reminder that we are covering this election against the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. But this week, there were also signs of how this country. Trump saying uh, wacky things as a reminder that we're a yeah. deeply divided nation. Not sure. Very banal way to put it. Yeah, weird um, way to put it. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it is a deeply divided nation. That's true. Right. But <laughs> but true. it has nothing to do with what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very weird seg very weird yeah. um correlation that she's making. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, you know, covering the weather. Like it's supposed to snow tomorrow in uh, I don't know, Wisconsin. That's another reminder that we are covering this election the backdrop of a deeply divided nation. Right. I like that one more actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm has the incredible capacity to come together. We saw that in Baltimore when the country rallied around that community after the collapse of the Francis Scott <laughs> Key Bridge, which claimed six lives. I mean, to the extent there was rallying together, of course, that's a wonderful thing. But I also saw Republicans, for example, blaming the open border right. for the bridge collapse. Um, we played a clip we of that, that yeah. last week on Useful Idiots on, on the regular episode. So me thinks maybe Kristen Walker here is being a little optimistic, which is, you know, it's it's nice to see, I guess. But uh, there, let's not also shy away from the fact that, of course, literally, I mean, and the only victims, I believe the only people who died in this awful disaster were, were immigrant workers yeah. who were trying to repair the bridge. And then you had some people trying to blame the open border somehow for the bridge collapsing. And also DEI. Remember, the DEI the, yes. happened under the DEI uh, uh, mayor. Yes, they, 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 they attacked the Baltimore mayor because apparently the Baltimore mayor has like, you know, uh, diversity uh, hiring policies. and Because he's black. I mean, let's also. Yeah, so he's a black yeah. mayor and they attacked him. They somehow yeah. blamed him for the bridge collapse because of his yeah. diversity policies. Yeah. Yeah. We are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. So in the face of heartbreak, 
we come together. We embrace one another and we come back stronger. I have Maybe a that's what she was referring to. Coming together, embracing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Is like, you know, we're Baltimore tough. We are we are Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. Does every state have that? Like, does every state like does California say we are Sacramento? We are, what yeah, Sacramento strong, Sacramento yeah. strong, yeah. Or is that just for uh, for just Maryland, particular states? Baltimore, right? Yeah. That's a good question. No. What would New York be? Um, what's the? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we never the, sleep. Well, Katie, like you're you're an expert with uh, Yiddish. What is what does right. Nachas mean? I don't I don't know. You don't know. What does it mean? I don't know. Just for some reason, New York Nachas. I so, like that. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me Google that quickly. Uh, it's pride and joy. Okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I like that. New yeah, York Nachas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah, that. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Look at that, uh, Aaron. No, thanks. Thank you. Uh, or is it uh, Empire State? Um, Savoir Fair? Savoir Fair. <laughs> yeah, it just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. That just rolls off the tongue. Yes. Empire State Savoir Fair. Empire yeah. State Savoir Fair. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's, you know, Giuliani really missed an opportunity uh, to, to praise uh, on 9 11. Mm. To unroll that. Empire State Savoir Savoir Fair. Yeah. yeah. In yes. New York Nachas. Yeah. 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 At an event centered on bipartisanship at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, I had the chance to speak with two governors this week about what is required for leadership in a crisis like the one Baltimore is facing. Whether it's a flood, whether it's a 9-11, whether it's uh, a calamity Watch like we him. saw today. Back. You don't know when things are going to happen, but then to quickly convene with your team and develop a strategy and communicate to the public. That to me, I think is leading. Kitty, should we pause for people to go and get their uh, notepads and write this down? Yeah, that, I think that's so. really, wow. So if something bad happens can, and you're in a leadership role, convene with your team. Yeah, convene with your okay. team. It rhymes, so it's easier to remember. Yeah, there you but go. But you still yeah. should get a notebook. You should, yeah. yeah. No, I, uh, like the rhyme helps me remember that because that's too complex of like a, a thought to really fully yeah. process. So yeah. something bad happens, you're you're in a team. What you want to do is bring your team together to convene about it. Right. How about, I never, how about, how about the, the bad thing? I never would have thought that. Wow. Like That's why these people get paid. To, that's why she's in, the, in a role of leadership. Yes. You don't get to be a leader without uh, having that. I was almost going to say savoir faire, but this mm. woman's from Massachusetts. So without having that um, Massachusetts morality. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let's hear more uh, leadership insight. Leadership. Bringing that transparency, being on the news, answering every question, not backing down from anything, uh, and being super clear about what the mission is, what the metrics are, who's involved, and what we're going to do to get out of it. Who that brings everyone's temperature level down and allows things to flow so much better. So you got to embrace, you got to lower the temperature and allow the flow. He's so impressed with himself that he even let out like an audible who. I know. Whoo, oh, I'm bringing the temperature down. Wow. Yeah. By answering every question. Woo. I know you can see they're really enjoying this. They yeah. they love dropping these platitudes. <laughs> Massachusetts Moxie. Yeah, that's good. Th thank okay, you. There I we was go. very I was very um I was not at my best right there. Yeah, mm. you were. Yeah. And joining me now is Congressman Jim Clark. Oh, okay. We'll get to him later. Speaking of Mr. leadership. Pharma, Mr. Big Pharma, yeah. Yes, speaking of leadership. Well, <laughs> that was a just a such an inspiring display of uh, bipartisan leadership there for me. And the thinking outside the box. Really. Convene your absolutely. team. Mm -hmm. Lower the Convene temp. Team. Open the flow. Yeah. Everything flows. Yeah. Sounds like he's, he kind of sounds like a yoga instructor. Mm hmm Woo. Woo. And then the flow. All right. Well, speaking of leadership, how's the Biden administration doing in leading global support for the Israeli genocide? Well, we got new news this week that, this is from the Washington Post, that the Biden administration has been quietly authorizing billions of dollars in new weapons shipments to Israel, which it continues to hide from the public. So basically, right. the strategy continues to be publicly pretend as if they have some sort of rift with Netanyahu. Oh, they're so upset. 
Biden's well, even saying an expletive out loud about right. Netanyahu. Well, quietly. And also, oh my God, we didn't veto the um, the ceasefire resolution. Yes, uh, for the first time, the U.S. did not veto a ceasefire resolution. But what it did this time, after uh, not vetoing it, it immediately declared it's not binding. Right. Declared it's not binding, misrepresented what it was. Yeah. And uh, we covered this on the regular episode with Norman Finkelstein. And also we covered a clip of this on Thursday Throwdown where John Kirby makes it clear in the most pathetic, groveling um, and smug and smarmy, because that's what he always is, way, that this doesn't change anything. Remember, he was like, why is BB net? Well, I don't get why this guy's upset, because BB canceled a delegation. Oh, my God, horror of all horrors. And yeah. John Kirby was like, why? Nothing's changed. There's no daylight between us and the uh, Israelis. Hence why that Israeli visit has been rescheduled for this week. So Israel's going to... Israel is going to come on Genocide Airlines to, after all, to so Washington to plan the assault on Rafa. So they basically delayed their meeting by one week to pretend as if there was some rift between Israel right. and the U.S. Even as the U.S. continues to send these weapons unfettered, as we're going to hear now from ABC News talking about this report that was in the Washington Post. But Senator Van Hollen, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, is also making news for his direct biting criticism of the Biden administration over its handling of Gaza, a conflict that is creating a humanitarian crisis and a diplomatic and political storm, which is... It's not a conflict, it's a genocide. And by the way, Chris Van Hollen, he's saying some great things. Give give him credit for that. But he's also continuing to vote the exact same way. Right. He's not putting his money where his mouth is. I'm actually not even sure he's cast a single vote so far against Israel. Maybe I've missed something, but in the most recent vote, which was to uh, give Israel about $3 billion more in assistance and also defund UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, Chris Van Hollen voted right. yes, right. even though he's been saying publicly that the U.S. has been lying to us about UNRWA, that the intelligence right. they claim to have about UNRWA staffers being involved in October 7th is not even there, that it's not what the Biden administration says it is. He's Which makes him, in some it. ways, I would say, actually worse because he knows he's doing the wrong thing. He does. And it's, I don't understand what the reason is. I've yet to see him being confronted about it. Of course he not, really right. should be. But uh, yeah. I mean, it's such a no brainer to ask someone about. And it's such an example of media malpractice that they don't. He's dividing the Democratic Party. The challenge President Biden is facing was on full display this week during a star-studded New York City fundraiser featuring three Democratic presidents, but also a healthy contingent of protesters outside speaking out against the administration's response to the war. And despite diplomatic talks pushing Israel not to expand its military action to Rafa, the Biden administration has moved in recent weeks to fulfill longstanding agreements to ship more fighter jets and 2,000 pound bombs to Israel. ABC's Britt Clenet in Jerusalem starts us off. I don't know if you guys remember this, but early on in the war, as like, sorry, earlier on in the genocide, forgive me for yeah. uh, misspeaking. Early on in the genocide, as Israel is facing global condemnation and people are asking, like, why is the U.S. providing these massive bombs to Israel as it drops them on dense neighborhoods? Then the Biden administration started leaking to the New York Times and other loyal outlets that we're going to give them smaller bombs. Don't worry. We're going to give them precision bombs. Yes, we realize maybe these bombs are not appropriate. Like, why are we bop, like dropping, like, bombs meant for huge battlefields onto, like, packed urban yeah. areas so the new line was we're giving smaller bombs well all that's been forgotten that was just again a lie it was a scam and the bombs the massive bombs two thousand pound bombs the delivery of those continue unabated more than six months later so disgusting a show of u.s support for israel despite boiling tensions over its planned military offensive in southern Gaza. The Biden administration signing off on billions of dollars worth of weapons as part of a long-standing agreement. The Washington Post reporting that the new arms transfer include 2,000-pound bombs. 
Cracks in the U.S.-Israeli relationship have been showing recently. The U.S. this week refusing to veto a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responding by calling off a visit to D.C. by a delegation to discuss Israel's planned ground invasion of Rafah, as Israel says they are disabling Hamas's capabilities and rescuing hostages. The meeting now being rescheduled. This says the humanitarian crisis grows. So there you go. The meeting was rescheduled. It wasn't canceled. It was rescheduled. So basically it's ah. like, you know, they're having a meeting to plan the genocide. Uh, the U.S. lets a, a U.N. resolution pass rather than veto it, calling for a ceasefire. Immediately says the, cease, the resolution is done by now. Right. But Israel, for Israel, sorry, that's not enough. You can't even publicly do anything that uh, questions what we're doing, which is mass murder. So therefore, right. we're going to reschedule the meeting for next week. And yeah. the media will pretend as if this, that's a big rift. Right. And I'm sure they coordinated all this right behind closed doors. Yeah, I would not be surprised about it at all. Worse by the day. Aid groups sounding the alarm. The UN warns famine is imminent and says it is Israel's legal responsibility to allow more aid in. UNICEF's James Elder speaking to us from Gaza. There are other crossings that can be opened. We can open things up in the north. You can indeed flood the Gaza Strip. As a convoy of aid ships set sail Saturday for Gaza, carrying 400 tons of food, children forced onto the streets of Rafa, selling whatever they can. Janine offering up used pots and pans, telling us <laughs> our future is gone. We used to learn in school, now there is no school. Nima Ashur shows me the tent she lives in with her family at a makeshift camp in Rafa after evacuating from the north. This is where we, we cook. We are suffering uh, in getting the water, the food. Now they are celebrating when we have it. To celebrate having basic necessities like food and water. Her family among the 1.3 million displaced people who have evacuated from northern and central Gaza to seek safety in Gaza's southernmost city, only to be told they may have to leave again any day now. You don't know when you are going to be attacked. Our neighbors has been killed. They were sleeping peacefully and they were killed. So we each night we think we might be the next. And in East Jerusalem, Israeli authorities threatening to deport some terminally ill patients back to Gaza when their treatment ends. Those deportations stopped by Israel's high court for now. 12-year-old Amira has a brain tumor. I don't want to go back, Amira tells me, visibly terrified at the prospect of returning to Gaza. Our house is gone. My grandfather's house is gone. Everything is gone. All of our dreams are gone, she says. And Martha, with those weapons on their way to Israel, hopes are being raised once again for an end or pause to the fighting. An Israeli delegation will leave for Cairo today to restart talks with Hamas on a hostage deal and possible ceasefire. Martha? Well, what are the hostage families saying? They're being they're saying that Netanyahu is basically lying to the world and that they're being used. Yeah, so and that, that if they speak out against him or what yeah. Israel is doing, they're going to get lowered on the list. Yeah. of hostages to be released. Yeah. And I've so, tweeted this out a few times. Like, where are all the bring them home now people? Oh, you mean like uh, like Brett, th- Brett, those like, Brett those like C-less, C-less celebrities? Yeah, yeah who, exactly. Yeah. Deborah Messing, Amy Schumer, yeah. or, a, you know, Michael Rappaport, Brianna Wu, who I don't even know how to describe her, or the politicians who claim to care about this. Mm-hmm. That is just watching that little girl. I mean, there's, I don't even know what to say. Except this is so, they're so monstrous. Like, it's like, it's not enough that her family has lost their home, that she has a brain tumor, but they want to deport her afterwards. Back to, back to the death back camp. Back to Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Back to the death camp. Yeah. So they'll save her from brain, a brain tumor and then they'll send her back so she can be killed. I wanted to show this headline. I, I mentioned this a few minutes ago. This is from November. This is from early November 2023. Uh, U.S. officials outlined steps to Israel to reduce civilian casualties. The measures include using smaller bombs against Hamas, U.S. officials said. How's that going? And, you know, this article points out in the Times that at that time, roughly 90% of the munitions that Israel dropped in Gaza were bombs of 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. Well, What did the Biden administration ship to Israel just a few days ago? More 2,000-pound bombs. 
So this claim that they were going to send Israel smaller bombs, this is somehow that would make a difference. It was a complete lie. They've just been lying to us every step of the way of the genocide because their only goal is to facilitate Israel's mass murder campaign and leave Gaza destroyed. And that's why we're seeing now the images of Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa, destroyed because they don't want to let Palestinians live. Right. Even after even after this mass murder campaign comes to an end, they don't want there to be anything for Palestinians to come back to. And the Biden administration is fully behind this, fully. And this is an example of the kind of lies that they use to advance it. With There's the help, so much. Sorry, yeah. W with the help of the New York Times and other establishment outlets. Yeah. I mean, the amount of blood on Biden's hands and our, the U.S. government's hands is just immeasurable. Well, for a counter argument, let's turn to Congress member James Clyburn, a reliable Biden ally. Remember, he's the one who you know, helped turn the tide for Biden in the 2020 primary right. uh, when he endorsed him in, in South Carolina. And that was a big boost to Biden. Um, really a stellar career of just corruption in the service of corporate elites. And yeah, um, big, big, big pharma guy, big, big, big pharma guy. But here he is. He's going to claim Anti Medicare for all overtly. Yeah, he's going to claim that actually Biden is using leverage against Israel and that, yes, you know, it's happening. Guys is horrible. But hey, we made a commitment to give them those weapons. So we got to follow through. Yeah. Yeah. Can't back that. Can't break that pledge. Yeah. Clinet in Jerusalem. Thank you. Gallup, the new Gallup poll finds that a majority of all Americans now oppose Israel's war in Gaza and approval of Israel's actions have dropped from 50 to 36 percent. Since November, there were a number of interruptions at that fundraiser, and a growing number of Democrats are now calling this a genocide, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So, Congressman, my question for you, do you agree with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez that what is happening is, in fact, a genocide? Well, I have not analyzed it to that extent, but i tell you this. Huh? He hasn't analyzed it to that extent, Aaron. You have not analyzed the uh, mass murder campaign that you're arming and funding to the extent where you don't know if it's a genocide or not. Notice how he doesn't say, no, it's not a genocide, right. you know, which he's voting, he's voting for, he's defending it. So given that you think he would know whether or not it's a genocide, if you're supporting something, you probably don't want it to be a genocide, but he's actually yeah. saying he's not going to answer the question because actually in real life, he knows it's genocide. Right. He doesn't want to admit that he's supporting it. So right. He says, I, haven't be analyzed it. I haven't analyzed right. it to that extent. Quite the admission, actually, I think. Yeah. That you wouldn't care enough to analyze it. You're like not even curious to know if the thing that you're yeah. funding, supporting, justifying is uh, genocide. Yeah. It's not a complex question. It's like, is it a genocide or not? Right. And he's saying, I haven't analyzed it to that extent. So the translation from politician speak is, yes, it's a genocide. I just don't want to admit it. Right. Because if it wasn't genocide, you think you'd say, no, it's not a genocide. Right. You know, but they can't even say that anymore. At first they could deny that, but now that's just undeniable. So he's playing dumb. What is happening is wrong and we need to make it right. Mm -hmm. And that's what President Biden is trying to do, trying to make it right. And I would say that that poll showed much of, uh, more of a dissatisfaction with Netanyahu than with uh -huh. the people of Israel. We stand with the people of Israel. The poll was about Biden's handling of this whole thing. And a majority of Americans say he's handling it wrong. And this is the classic Aaron, strategy. Aaron, that's the way you're reading it. Yeah, that's the way I'm reading But this is the classic strategy of making everything, basically using Netanyahu as the boogeyman. Exactly. All while continuing to arm him and his government. Right. Right. You know? As if the other members of the government, first of all, there are people who are, imagine this. I mean, I don't know how it's possible, but even worse than, sorry, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, excuse me. But more, more, more um, genocidal than, or openly genocidal, I guess, than Netanyahu. And then other people, no one really wants to have, uh, pursue a policy less genocidal than, than Netanyahu. It's not like if you got rid of him, but they like pretending this because that lets them kind of uh, look like they're condemning a bad guy. When, of course, if they thought this guy were bad, they would also stop 
funding his present onslaught genocide exactly. Exactly. if it's that bad yeah and i'm sorry someone in the audience very responsibly said that the likes are very low where are we at wilson what do we got uh we already have a thousand likes oh all right i mean we should be at well that's pretty good i've trained you somewhat we should be at least at i mean that's still under half guys it's under half uh i don't i believe in you that you're not all hate watching uh but katie remember a lot of these people probably haven't analyzed the like button to that extent so it's you true. can't really blame them right much like genocide yeah where are we at now guys if you haven't liked just give a like like us when you give us a thumbs up you're giving corporate media a thumbs down how'd we do 1.2k all right not too bad yes. but you guys need to be better patriots all right let's go back to jc we do not like the fact that this country's policy is a two-state solution and netanyahu has what is he saying we do not like the fact that this country's policy is a two-state solution yeah i think he means that he's annoyed that netanyahu is openly saying there will be no two-state solution when if you're the u.s you're supposed to pretend that you support a two-state solution right. even though as you've been doing everything you can to destroy that outcome for for decades because uh, israel and the u.s have no interest actually in giving palestinians their minimal rights to self-determination they've been crushing that that's their project but if you're the u.s you're supposed to pretend that you support an eventual palestinian state somewhere in the distance that will never actually happen undermined that's two-state solution for as long as he's been in office he sold his soul to the right wingers in israel in order to maintain power for himself so that's did you sir so did you sir. Clear to you. Yeah, yeah right you're yeah. funding this guy who you're saying is you're funding his war his yes. genocide yes again it's really not that complex like even their narrative their fake narrative of netanyahu being this kind of lone right winger in israel in a sea of people who aren't that genocidal if that's true why are you funding his war Uh, and those people are opposed to a two-state solution. Biden is for a two-state solution. Democrats are for a two-state solution. That is the only way for us to move forward. And so no, you're for the propaganda talking point of saying you're for a two-state right. solution. When in reality, you, by supporting Israel, you throughout your career have undermined it. Because what has Israel done? over the last many decades is expand the West Bank settlements to make a two-state solution impossible while offering Palestinians these so-called peace deals that would make Israel's settlement uh, blocks permanent, which make a Palestinian state non-contiguous and therefore non-existent. That's the actual policy, but you're just supposed to pretend, you're supposed to pay lip service to this idea of a two-state solution. And now, I mean, it's over now, forget it. Right. Like it's just, you know, it's just, these people have made it impossible. Netanyahu, yeah. And people like James Clyburn and Joe Biden and Donald Trump, everybody, all of them, they're the ones who've destroyed the idea of, of a two-state solution. It, it once, I think, was possible, but now right. it's, it, well, it's Well, that's what, that's what, I mean, Gideon Levy, the great Israeli Haaretz journalist who we've had on the show, I, I, there's a, uh, he engaged in one of these like Oxford debates about the two-state solution. And one of the points he made is that everyone who's now for the two-state solution are people who, when it was viable, were against it. So he, you know, years ago was Gideon Levy was for it. And all the people who are now get for it were against it. And all the people like him now realize that it's not viable. But let's, sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to have to finish that Clyburn clip. Apologies. And if you thought that Clyburn clip was bad to this point, just wait till you see oh, what's yeah. next. Buckle your seatbelt. This seat drop in support has nothing to do with the people of Israel and everything to do with Netanyahu. Yeah. Congress. I mean, the poll after poll shows over even the people who don't like Netanyahu because they think that he's responsible for October 7th or let October 7th happen or didn't keep them safe. It's I'd really like to believe. And there are some Israelis who are who are good. Of course, there are some Israelis who are protesting the war and they get thrown in jail, literally. Like there's a teacher who got thrown in jail over just saying some things that were remotely 
humane, uh, empathetic to like his crime was portraying Palestinians as humans mm -hmm. and he's in jail. Uh, he was thrown to jail and you've seen uh, Israeli police like beat protesters, but there is overwhelming support for the amount of force being used against Palestinians. Do you think the U.S. is doing enough, though? It's just approved another uh, order of shipments of munitions and weapons to Israel. A Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen saying the Biden administration, quote, needs to use their leverage effectively and should receive these basic commitments before greenlighting more bombs for Gaza. Commitments to preserve civilian lives is what he's referencing. Should the U.S. be using its leverage and withholding those munition shipments? Well, the leverage it has to be used, and I think the president is using his leverage. But it's what leverage? What leverage is he using? Serious talks? I think uh, just by using the word leverage, that means right. you're using your leverage. Yeah. You know? So right. it's like... Uh, He's manifesting yes. the leverage just by yeah, mentioning exactly. it. Just by using the word leverage, that, that that's sufficient. Right. You know, I think that's what James Leverage is talking about. Because like the power, uh, in real life, like that book, The Secret, you know. Yeah, because in real life, Biden is shipping these weapons off to Israel as it commits mass murder, uh, and basically facilitating the genocide. But anyway, we're gonna hear James Clyburn try to explain how, yes, really Biden's using his leverage somehow, yeah. and and he has no other choice, according to James Clyburn. Is he now, using enough of it, Congressman? Has... They, they just accused that they just uh, approved that new shipment of weapons. Well, the question is. What were the agreements made last year and the year before, and whether or not we are going to keep our word? We cannot go back on our word and expect for other people uh, to keep theirs. So we have to keep our word. And so I have no idea what may be in these deals, what the president may be living up to. But the fact of the matter is, we must not lose our integrity as a nation, uh, and we've got to stand in support of the Israel. Well, you are watching uh, someone lose their integrity in real time as they scramble to explain why Biden administration continues to arm a mass murder campaign. And his new excuse is we have to keep our word because I'm sorry, we promised Israel these weapons. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we promised Israel these weapons years ago. I don't even know because I'm not familiar with the details because obviously I don't care about arming a he hasn't studied regime. It to that extent. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, but uh, we have to keep our word. But doesn't our word also include a commitment to follow the law? And doesn't the law include that we can't arm people who are committing, who are carrying out human rights violations? And is genocide possibly a violation of human rights? Uh, I think it is, but not. I mean, they were Cyber breaking. Ground. How about all the times Israel didn't keep its word, pretending that they are protecting civilians, pretending that they're targeting Hamas? They no, broke sure. the Leahy law. Yeah, it, it's just a really pathetic display. It's still but pathetic. you know, that that's the. That's your job. If you uh, work in the if, if you work for the U.S. government, if you're a lawmaker, if you're supporting all this, that's your job now is to go out there and be a spokesperson for genocide and try to scramble uh, for ways to excuse it. And that's what uh, James Clyburn just did. It's called the genocide shuffle. Yeah, well, he's doing it. Okay, let's turn to Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen again. He's saying some good things, but right. uh, when it's time to vote, he's been voting to arm Israel and to defund UNRWA. And he really should be asked about that. He's not here. But let's hear what he has to say. I'm joined now by Senator Chris Van Holland of Maryland. Good morning, Senator. Good to see you. Let's talk about those weapons. You've been outspoken about the U.S. continuing to supply weapons, but these were approved a long time ago. So what could the Biden administration have done? Well, it's good to be with you. Uh, we need a little more hope in the world this Easter, including a ceasefire and a return of all the hostages. Uh, look, the Biden administration had been planning to submit to Congress a new round of uh, weapons proposals. Uh, they decided not to do that because clearly they knew they would encounter resistance. And so they've essentially done an end run uh, with this earlier version. So my view, uh, Martha, is until the Netanyahu government uh, allows more assistance uh, into Gaza to help people who are literally starving to death, we should not be sending more bombs. What, do you think they should have tried? Okay, so if Israel right now said, finally, we're going to stop um, completely cutting off basic aid, we're going to let a, a, a more aid in, then Chris Van Hollen would support the weapons that are right. 
killing people because the problem is Great. remember how much aid Israel stops blocking. They're still dropping U.S. weapons on innocent people. So he's basically saying there, it sounds like, if Israel just lets in a little bit more aid, then I'm okay with sending off these massive bombs that slaughter innocent people. That's what he's saying. That's that's right now the opposition in Congress to Biden and Netanyahu. is someone who's saying, I'm down for more bombs, just let in a little bit more aid. That's his position. Right. We're supposed to like see him as like the voice of reason right now yeah. in Congress. The he's moral voice. Yeah, he's supporting mass murder just as long as it comes a little bit more aid uh, to the people that are being slaughtered. Uh, those who survive, presumably, the weapons that he wants to send. So disgusting. Just stop this. Just not send more weapons. I think the Biden administration needs to enforce the president's request. He's made two very simple requests. Uh, one, allow more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. The president said no excuses. Uh, he's also said it's a red line for him uh, to have an invasion of Rafah. So it's my view that as part of a partnership, we should get those assurances from the Netanyahu government up front rather than just send weapons now and ask questions later. Okay, so his position is, if Israel says we're going to let in a little bit more aid and we're not going to assault Rafa, then we can give them the weapons. Right. Um, but, for example, presumably he'd be okay then with them uh, destroying al-Shifa because that was done with U.S. weapons. But as long as they let in a little bit more aid to Gaza, he'd be okay with that. That's what I'm hearing from Chris Van Hollen. Yeah, and this is supposed to be the best we can get? Yes, yes best, it is. like, opposition we can get? Well, let's hear more from uh, our best opposition, Chris Van Hollen. You believe that Israel is currently blocking aid into Gaza. Do you consider that a war crime? Uh, there's no doubt that blocking aid into Gaza is a violation of international humanitarian law. With respect to certain... So a war crime. Like, why, why can't he answer the question? It's a war crime. Yeah, and it's not like some... Uh, um, it's not like a an inter yeah. When you break international law, like this isn't like some like some maritime thing or some like um, yeah, exactly service thing. Yes, there are many international laws. Right. Uh, there's war crimes are among them, but you can be more specific and say right. that in this case it's a war crime. Right. Rather than being vague, it's a violation of international law, which as as you point out. Could refer to like you know, maritime things. interdiction or something like yeah. that. Yes. Certain individuals in the Netanyahu government, people like Finance Minister Smotrich and Ben Gavir, who have not only said they want to block aid into Gaza, but have taken steps to block aid into Gaza, that is a war crime. Netanyahu is the prime minister. Right. Is well, he a war criminal? Well, we're going to have to make a decision as to what the intent of the full Israeli government is. I mean, these are members of the government, the finance minister and the, and the person who's in charge of the police. Uh, but Wait, there's war crimes under this prime minister. Definitionally, he's a war criminal. Absolutely. These but poor politicians, they, they didn't take logic. <laughs> you know, if A and then B, then C... Maybe we can get them some tutors. The only logic they understand is if I am like remotely critical of Israel, then APAC is going to flood my opponent with tens of millions of dollars uh, in funding and maybe not give the money to me. I think that's right. the only logic that these people understand. Yep. Ultimately, that will have to be decided down the road. But in the meantime, let's just get more assistance to starving people in Gaza. Uh, you know, one third of the shipments of a humanitarian assistance into northern Gaza. Okay, that's great. I'm glad he's urging humanitarian assistance. But this whole thing about let's it let's talk about that later, whether or not he's a war criminal, whether or not there are war crimes being committed now, whether or not there's genocide. They're blocking aid. That needs to be addressed. Gaza have been blocked in the last month. You could open their Reds Crossing in the north and get more assistance in right now. I mean, kids have starved to death. So I'm just saying to President Biden, you said no excuses. 
when it comes to getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to drag his feet. So instead of just sending more bombs without in, in turn getting the request that you want, Mr. President, let's at least make this a partnership. Do you believe there is, again, another... I mean, okay, I, I think we've heard enough of him. This is like the best we can do right now in the Senate. Him and, I mean, Bernie Sanders is a little bit better, but uh, it's he's basically pleading for Biden to adopt what still is a uh, ghoulish position, which is basically send in a little bit more aid and we'll give you all the bombs you want. That's the Van Hollen opposition and a Biden. Just more aid for bombs. Right. We want to send in, we want you to send in more aid to help the people who you're killing with bombs, which we want to send you more of. Yes. Yes. Well, somebody who doesn't even uh, care about even allowing a trickle of aid is Senator Rick Scott, who just went to Israel and is going to report back on his firsthand experience. And he's always a fan favorite. We love looking at Rick Scott, hearing him. I love his uh, what, voice. I what love a pleasant his face. character. Yeah, he's so, so yeah, he's a, he does a lot for the the Skeletor community, for Skeletor visibility and representation. Representation matters. So, and by the way, I just want to read this comment uh, from what? As a Palestinian, I feel some vindication after decades. Thanks, Aaron and Katie. By the way, Katie, you're hilarious even during a genocide. Uh, sorry, I didn't read that because I Kate a lot looks like Yiddish, but I just want to say. I mean, I'm glad some people in this horror, I'm glad that there's some vindication that Palestinians are feeling probably after decades of saying that Israel's committing war crimes. Now it's, thank God for social media, it's on display. I didn't mean to read that second part. I thought it was, she was, it was being said about both of us, honestly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear from Rick Scott. Joining us now, GOP Senator Rick Scott of Florida. Senator Scott, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Well, happy Easter. It's a special day for Christians. It absolutely is. It's a special day for everyone. Jews like bunny rabbits and Easter egg hunts, and I'm sure Muslims do too. <laughs> okay. Is And um, we, by the way, just have a, a statement from the White House on that. We're going to get to that a little bit later in the show. Indeed. There's been some controversy you may have heard. But I want to start here with the bridge and us just talking with uh, Governor Moore. There is talk that some of this will have to come through a funding package in uh, Congress where you guys are fighting over a lot. of. We wanted to hear the parts of this where he talks about Gaza. So let's see if we can find that. I think um, it starts right, right there. Yeah. Yeah, a little earlier. Support, but they're going to go into their... With Israeli leaders. It's, it's not going over well. I met with President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and other, the Foreign Minister, the Defense Minister. They know that they have to go into Rafah to destroy Hamas. They have to destroy Hamas. Uh, they need American support, but they're going to go into, they're going to go into Rafah to get rid of Hamas, whether the U.S. supports them or not. I don't... Oh, sorry. I don't understand it. Uh, we still have American hostages. I met with families of uh, that, you know, their family, American hostage families of while I was over there. I went to one of the kibbutz I'd been to in 2019, where 60, over 60 um, Jews were killed just because they're Jews, kids. No, not true. They were not killed because they're Jews. They're killed because they live in a settler colonial state that uh, is living on land stolen from the people of Gaza. That's why, because most people of Gaza are refugees. Uh, people of Gaza come from actually some of the communities that were attacked by um, by Hamas on October 7th. And yeah, that's why they died, is because they're living in a settler colonial state that's occupying and besieging the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And the people who are occupied resisted. And if you don't want to see those things happen, you should stop occupying people. But right. That's as not a Gideon, contract you can grasp. As Gideon Levy says, you can't um, imprison 2 million people and not pay a price. Um, people are raped. They're just shot at point blank. They were burned alive. I went to a music festival where 363 people were killed just because they were Jews. Uh, oh, my God. All right. Um, again, that's not why they were killed. Uh, if, um, you know, if it were... Any ethnicity occupying right. Palestine, Palestine would still resist. So it has nothing to do with Israelis being Jews. Uh, it's Israel acting in the name of the Jewish people, 
that right. endangers everybody, including Jewish people. Um, so the answer to this is to stop occupying and displacing people and confining them to a death camp. Um, and again, he repeats the claim that there was rape on October 7th. Right. To date, there is not a single piece of evidence that there was rape on October 7th. The only evidence there is, purported evidence, are purported witnesses claiming they saw rape, but at least four of them now have been shown to be liars, uh, as we've shown at the gray zone. The New York Times actually recently had to admit that one of their key witnesses and their big story, remember their big story in late December about how Hamas weaponized sexual violence? Right. Even the New York Times had to admit recently that their one of their key witnesses who claimed to have seen uh, evidence that two women on kibbutz Beria were sexually assaulted, they had to admit he was a liar, uh, that his his claims were undermined by videotape taken by an Israeli soldier. So right, that and story, even the the kibbutz the kibbutz has said that they they, they have too. Yes. So um, there's no physical evidence or forensic evidence of rape. There's not a single alleged victim uh, that's been identified to date as a, as a victim of rape. The only what about who, the New York Times um, that New York Times story? Where that woman, you know, the recent one where the woman came forward. That is a that's someone who claims she was sexually assaulted in captivity. Right, not on October seventh. Yeah, yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's in you know that's in the period after October seventh. Um, right. Yes. And I right. haven't even looked into that one, yeah. but we're talking about October seventh. Right, right, right. Which is the, which is the talking point, and which is what about, people have been. Like rate, like raised on that idea yeah. since this happened, yeah, yeah. And of course, Palestinian women have alleged sexual assault at the hands of Israeli soldiers, but we don't hear about that at all no. because that talking point uh, is it's not useful to right. using uh, to um, manufacturing support for genocide. So we don't hear about right. it, right? And but, also, we know from a State Department um, person who resigned uh, when when the State Department brought to Israel a case of a child being raped, allegations of a child being raped, Israel responded by defunding the NG, declaring the NGO that brought that case forward a terrorist organization and shutting it down. So believe certain women, even when they don't come forward, uh, but don't believe Palestinians when they do. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's enough of Rick Scott. Let's turn to. Really? Is it ever enough, Rick Scott? <laughs> I think so, okay. uh, especially because we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to Ro Khanna, member of Congress. He's been critical of the genocide in Gaza. He's called for a ceasefire, but he continues to also shill for the guy making it all happen, which is Joe Biden. And here's Ro Khanna. Among other things, um, brand new pullout this week shows that when people are asked about foreign policy, they give an 11 point edge to President Trump over President Biden. Um, and specifically, when we asked about Israel and Hamas a few weeks ago, there was a 65 percent disapproval rating for President Biden. Um, what do you make of that? Americans don't think he's managing this well. I think people realize that there's a crisis. They see images of uh, people dying and they want the war to end. They want Israel to be secure, but they also want Palestinian lives uh, not to be lost. And I think once the war comes to an end under the president's leadership, his numbers will improve, just like his numbers have bounced back on the economy. And in the Bloomberg poll, he's uh, closed the gap in a lot of the swing states. OK, we'll talk. OK, well, that's something to look forward to. Once Joe Biden stopped facilitating a genocide, his poll numbers will include uh, will will improve, according to Rick right. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you want to reduce genocide to electoral politics, yeah. To be well, fair, it's not like like Biden. Uh, Biden obviously doesn't care about uh, human beings or lives or children or elderly or disabled people being slaughtered. Yeah. No. And I guess uh, the question is, will Biden even end this? Because he's so committed to it. He's so, and he's shown he won't say no to Israel on anything. That who knows. If he's going to put an end to it at all. So Rokhan has hope for those rising poll numbers. I don't know. He should he should reconsider that as he campaigned for genocide joke. Okay, let's turn to a different issue, which is neocons in Washington have been really frustrated with the House Speaker Mike Johnson because he's been stalling on having a vote on giving another sixty one billion dollars for the Ukraine proxy war. You can't even say it's giving the money to Ukraine because the money doesn't go to Ukraine. It goes to most of the military industrial complex. Right. 
It's and that aid. Allows, I like the aid, the way they call it, aid. Yeah, and that allows them to basically build new weapons and then old weapons get sent to Ukraine. And that's called aid to Ukraine. Uh, and so neocons have good news, which is that Speaker Mike Johnson has given some strong indications that he will bring finally uh, that bill up for a vote very, very soon after they get back from the Easter recess, which is just another lesson in Washington that neocons, even though they always fail in their policies, they always get their way. So it looks like they will get their money. Uh, it looks like they will get their vote for right. Ukraine funding and they'll get their money. So here is Congressman member Don Bacon, who's a Republican. He supports the Ukraine funding and here he is hasn't been brought to the floor for a vote. So my question for you is when Congress gets back from recess, how confident are you that this aid will be passed and how's it gonna happen, Congressman? Well, Speaker Johnson is an honest man. Uh, one of the, uh, he, he truly walks his faith. He doesn't talk his faith, he walks his faith, shows it. He's committed to making this. I love a guy who walks his faith rather than just talking his faith. You know that that uh, Aerosmith song, "Walk This Way, mm -hmm. Talk This Way." It could be like, "Walk His Face." Yes, there we go. Face. Yeah, another <laughs> hit right there. Useful idiot's hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, let's get that on tape. Uh, it is. What well, is on tape? It is on tape right there, everybody. There you um, go. You're welcome, yeah. everyone. Let, let's get that recorded. I mean, you know, yeah. we got to smash right there. Walk His Face. Okay, well, let's hear more from John Bacon about how Mike Johnson is walking his faith all the way to a sixty-one billion dollar vote for Ukraine. For the Ukraine proxy war. The first, the top priority when we return back to Washington, D.C. Now, most of the Republicans that I work with, they want military aid. Uh, they're not as in support of all the humanitarian aid that was in the Senate bill. So, so myself and Brian Fitz. I like that. I like that. That honesty on the part of Republicans and this Republican. Me too. So, okay. So, you know, for months we've been hearing about like Republicans, there's this isolationist faction who opposes more funding for Ukraine. It turns out, according to John Bacon, that really their problem is they're cool with the military component right. of this bill. They just don't want to give any humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Yeah. They just want military. <laughs> so that's the Republican opposition. I mean, right. it's not I mean, there are some people who don't want to give any money at all. Right. But he's saying, really, there are, there's a strong contingent. They just don't want to give humanitarian aid. Right. So uh, bombs, yes. Blankets, no. No, right. Yeah. Patrick? from Pennsylvania, but also working with Democrats, Jared Golden and Ed Case from Hawaii. Uh, we put a bill together that focuses on military aid, mm -hmm. uh, a $66 billion uh, bill that provides military aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Also has some border security in that. We put this in as a discharge petition with, the, and it gives the speaker and the house to amend our package. So what I think we're gonna do is get a bill that's focused on military aid, yeah. but I know the speaker also wants to have like the Repo Act where we repossess some Russian assets and mm -hmm. help them pay for this. Also, maybe some lend. What do you mean just steal Russian assets right. on top of all the assets that have been stolen already and use that to pay for Repo. Yeah, I like the, that. The, the the funding for Ukraine. By the way, have any of these, you know, self-described Christians read Jesus? Not that carefully. They have to quote yeah. James Clyburn, they haven't analyzed him to that extent. They have not analyzed Jesus' teachings to that extent because I'm pretty sure Jesus would not be in support of like slaughtering the women and children of Palestine and shipping off tens of billions of dollars for a proxy war in Ukraine. That, by the way, happens to benefit uh, an army that has neo-Nazis incorporated into its ranks, which is the Ukraine right. army. They incorporate battalions like the Azov Battalion, which is neo-Nazi, which Congress officially still bans support for because that law was passed years ago before Russia invaded. But any, everyone ignores that. But um, apparently that is walking your faith is yeah. by, you know, uh, sending off more weapons of death and destruction. I mean, it's just so funny that the guy that, like says that part out loud about how they would like military aid, but not humanitarian aid. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He doesn't even know to not say that. No, why not? Yeah. And lease uh, segments to the bill. So some of this may become in the form of loans, but also it's very important to the Republican side that we just don't give President Biden a blank check. And why is that? A lot of weapons that Ukraine needs, the president has not given them, like long range attackums. He's been provi providing weapons that provide a stalemate uh, in Ukraine. Why not give Ukraine the weapons 
but, that are higher tech, more capable, and to help them prevail on the battlefield. <laughs> so we want to force the president's hand on the kinds of weapons that they're, that but, we will provide. But well, what what, what uh, stellar congressional opposition to Joe Biden by criticizing him for not being belligerent enough with a nuclear armed power and a proxy war. And right. He has given attack on weapons, so Don Bacon's not being fair to, to Joe Biden there. Um, yeah, and, he's telling uh, him short. Yeah, but he is accurately saying that Biden has funded a stalemate, which is the point of the whole proxy war. It's just to fund a stalemate, use Ukraine to fight Russia so that Ukraine weakens Russia. Everyone's admitted that now, Lloyd Austin, Jake Sullivan, and we don't have to fight them ourselves. And it's great for everybody except for Ukrainians and Russians and the rest of the world that are endangered by all this, but it's really good for the military industrial complex and their beneficiaries in Washington who get their donations. And uh, yeah, Don Bacon wants that, wants to keep that going. And it looks like he'll get his wish. His wish. Yeah. Christmas. Christmas comes early this year. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's go to, let's move ahead a little bit to, uh, let's go to Mike Lawler. Uh, he's okay. another member of Congress. Um, he's another he's another Republican who supports arming uh, Ukraine in this proxy war. And he spoke to Dana Bash of CNN. Has he given you any has he given you any commitment that this vote will happen when the House returns from recess? By the way, which is, I, I believe, one of the most popular questions right now on corporate TV. When will the House give more money for the Ukraine right. proxy war? Not should we be doing this? Not should we have blocked all peace opportunities? Well, that would require times? that they actually acknowledge that we blocked it. So there we go. Yeah, they haven't covered that. So they can't, of course, ask whether it's good or not because apparently it didn't happen. Again, like James Clyburn, they just haven't analyzed it to that detail. Right. You know? right. But when will we get the money? That's the question. Uh, I believe there will be a vote when we get back uh, from the Easter recess. Uh, certainly, uh, this is critically important uh, for our allies. Uh, we are the leader of the free world, and we cannot uh, shirk on our responsibility uh, to, to uphold uh, and defend democracies across the globe. It's why I uh, introduced, along with Brian Fitzpatrick and Jared Golden, uh, the Defending Borders, Defending Democracies Act, which would provide lethal aid to Ukraine, to Israel, uh, to Taiwan, uh, as well as uh, enact uh, serious border provisions, including Remain in Mexico and Title 42. Uh, and we are pushing for a vote. I have signed a discharge petition uh, to allow for that vote. Uh, but I am hopeful that the Speaker will put the bill on the floor uh, or an amended version of the bill on the floor uh, so that we can once and for all. You know, it's unfortunate for me. Whenever I hear like on the floor, I think of the dance yeah. floor. Oh, yeah. You know? But that's not the floor they're talking about. They're doing a different dance, which is the dance of death. And it's just unfortunate that, you know, the term refers to both the dance floor, which is a, a wonderful place. Right. And the house floor, which is a place of destruction and, and genocide and, and proxy wars. It's just it's you unfortunate. Got the, the pelvic wall, wall, uh, floor, too. I didn't think of that. Yes. Yeah. But there, yes, <laughs> that's a good vibe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, Floor is just such a diverse term. I it suppose. really is. Lends yeah. itself to so many things. And by the way, this guy's a big, like he and Richie Torres worked on uh, bills to implement and strengthen the Abraham Accords. So he's Which not only the, great on uh, Ukraine, but great on uh, Palestine. Israel yes. Palestine. So, so that was Donald Trump's and, and Jared Kushner's initiative to basically sideline Palestinian rights right. and get uh, Arab states. Arab kingdoms to make deals to normalize with Israel while giving right. Palestinians nothing. So not surprising that Mike Lawler is a is a fan of that. Yeah. Uh, ensure that our allies have the aid and support that they need. You said you're hopeful. Have you? I'm assuming you've spoken to him directly. Has he made a commitment? Again, Dana Bash. When are we getting the proxy war money? Right. Has he when made a commitment? When is that sweet, sweet military funding yeah. coming through? Yeah. She sounds annoyed. She sounds annoyed that it hasn't happened yet. So she's yeah. Look at her face. She's like, "Have yeah. you gotten a commitment? Because if not, yeah. I don't want to talk to you. Go yeah, get a commitment. Yeah. Come yeah. back to me when you've gotten a commitment." Yeah. 
I have spoken to him directly. I'm not going to uh, delve into the, the details of that conversation. I love that. But I am confident that he is going to bring a bill to the floor uh, and that we will have a vote. Uh, you know, he understands the, the responsibility that we have. Look, China, Russia, and Iran are not our friends. They're not our allies. They are seeking to undermine and destabilize the free world uh, and undermine the United States economically at every turn. Uh, and so we need to uh, push back. Uh, we so these bad guy countries are trying to undermine us economically. So therefore, let's take 61 more billion dollars on top of the hundreds of billions of hundred, hundred plus billion dollars we've already authorized in the Ukraine proxy war and funnel that money into a futile proxy war that is just getting people killed in Ukraine right. and is wiping out generations of Ukrainians. And they're I mean, arresting Ukrainians for um, not serving. Yeah, and, and for trying to flee and for and resisting. For to flee, yeah. But it's like from the point it just took it from the point of view of like trying to like defend yourself economically. Is there another thing you can do aside from funnel more of your money into a futile proxy war that only enriches the military industrial complex? Like even if you only care about protecting US from supposedly these bad guy countries that want to destroy right. us economically, aren't you kind of doing their bidding by pouring more money into right. a horrible proxy war that is actually weakening the u.s i think and and also bringing with... russia and china closer together yes exactly exactly i mean i really wish i could sit down on one of these strategic planning sessions because these guys are you know they're i don't think they're really using their, it through yeah they're really not yeah. thinking it through but again like james Clyburn said we haven't analyzed it to that detail right. you know to that extent yeah we need to support our allies uh and if ukraine were to fall uh, and and uh, Russia uh, successful uh, in this endeavor, uh, that would have a catastrophic impact on Eastern Europe. Well, Ukraine is falling because rather than accept the Minsk peace accords, which were reached in 2015 uh, to end the war that erupted because we backed a coup in Ukraine in 2014, right. uh, and rather than uh, support the peace deal that was offered by Russia right before it invaded, and rather than support the peace deal that was reached after Russia invaded between Ukraine and right. Russia, we fueled the war. And so right. Ukraine is falling. And the more we pour money into this war, the more territory I think it will lose. So from that point of view, what he is supporting, what bipartisan members of Congress are supporting and the corporate media is actually Ukraine's continued destruction. But it's such a great deal, as people keep pointing out. Yeah, uh, it's so cheap, relatively speaking. And, you know, Ukrainians are the ones being used as cannon fodder. We don't have to have any boots on the ground. What's not to love? <laughs> exactly. OK, well, I think we're done with our clips, right? Yeah. OK, yeah. so let's just we're, we want to read a few super chats. Yeah. Answer so any questions if there are. Yeah. any. So let's go do some of these super chats super fast. Thank you, Aaron and Katie. Love the show. Your show serves a great purpose. Keep up the great good work. Why did Biden say feds would cover key bridge expenses versus, say, Lahaina or East Palestine? Palestine? Good question. Um, good morning. Thanks, Sparky. Humanitarian 2,000-pound bombs. Yep. I'm so happy I found y'all show. Thanks, pals. Uh, make Israel Syria again. In those Ottoman Empire days, Levant Jews got along fine with their neighbors, whether Muslim, Christian, or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denazify Israel. Good luck with that. Wade Worth, always so supportive. Thank you so much. Um, we read the what's thing. Nathaniel, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Martha Allen. We appreciate and love your work, Katie and Aaron. And Martha Allen does great work herself. Uh, Tupac Amaru, uh, Betsy Catherine Brown. Uh, if we are tallying atrocities, Israel atrocities, Cities slightly greater than Palestine, Palestinian atrocities, 30K is slightly larger than 2K. It's true if you crunch the numbers. Um, that was a boy, that was a boy raped in custody. IDF raided the NGO and took all their computers and all their, uh, and declared them a terrorist organization. Yep. And uh, thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. And we're going to, I don't, we're not going to say, but we have a great guest. You guys are really going to love our guest this week. All right. Well, that's been this week's Monday morning. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Remember, our website, which you can see there below, is usefulidiotspodcast.com. Go there to support the show and get bonus content. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.